living the faith and what can be done to make lasting disciples. I'm going to talk to an expert about it. It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, biblical scholar and cultural commentator, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice for moral sanity and spiritual clarity. Call 866-34-TRUTH to get on The Line of Fire. And now, here's your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Hey, friends, I have really been looking forward to today's broadcast with my special guest, Ron Luce. Those of you who were young people oh, a few years back or have been involved in youth ministry would know Teen Mania. Uh, many, many thousands of young people deeply impacted, taking missions trips, serving around the world. Ron is now leading Generation Next. We had a talk a few months back about what's happening in the church, why so many young people are leaving the faith, and keys to making lasting disciples. So we're going to have a really eye-opening, constructive talk today. But if you have a question, maybe you're in youth ministry yourself, maybe you're a pastor, maybe you're a young person and have questions. If you have specific questions about this topic and want to talk to Ron, the number to call is 866-34-TRUTH, 866-348-7884. Or you can post your question on YouTube or Facebook. Ask Dr. Brown on YouTube or Facebook, but again, only relevant to the discussion that we're having today. Without further ado, Ron, it is great to have you on the line of fire today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Brown. It is an honor to be with you. Well, uh, we've only spent a little time together face-to-face, so when we finally talked, it, it was great to compare notes at greater length, and studies that you've been involved in, ministry you've been involved in, is all pointing to practical solutions. But first, let's go back in history a little bit. Tell us how Teen Mania was formed, and what you see in retrospect as the, the strengths of Teen Mania, perhaps the weaknesses as well. Well, that's a loaded question. Talk about it. So, uh, by the grace of God, my wife Katie and I felt back in 1986 that we were supposed to do everything we could to um, set a generation on fire and give them a heart to change the world. And uh, so, it was just me and her and our little car, and we're driving around, and it was just amazing. You know, having you know, we were doing these crusades. We have 10, 15 kids at a time packing out living rooms across America. Mm. And I'd preach, I'd preach like there's like 10,000 there, even though there's 10. Uh-huh. And, uh, and encourage them to get totally committed, all for the call, give their life to Christ, and then go on mission trips. And so immediately that next summer, we took 30 young people on mission trips. The next year, we were on the road again. And, you know, I'm literally calling every little church in America that had no idea who we were, um, which was all of them, and <laughs> going to the local libraries. Do you remember Microfish? <laughs> Um, yeah. I'm microfish of of of, uh, uh, of yellow pages from different cities around the country of churches calling, doing cold calls. Hey, wow. you don't know me, but my name is Ron Luce. And if and I started doing the math, after you do about after about every forty phone calls, um, someone would say, "Yes, send me a brochure." So I just did the math. If I made enough phone calls, I'd have enough you know, events to go to. And like I said, we'd do two or three events a year. I mean, a week, and then um, travel from place to place. By the grace of God, the next year, we had more events. After three or four years, they got uh, too many. I mean, there's 300,000 churches in America. We, we're never going to reach them all. So we started doing conferences where a youth pastor could bring his youth group to an event and um, in a region. And so then we, we called those Acquire the Fire conferences, and we started those in 91. And uh, literally for 25 years, um, 30 three weekends a year we do an event in a city every year so um but they just kept growing and by the grace of god uh, you know literally we saw uh, more than three million young people come uh, to the events and you know thousands and thousands come to christ and our whole thing was we know you can whip young people into a frenzy of emotionalism but we didn't want to do that we would try to be very creative in how we cre- uh, communicate the gospel and, of course, we'd always present the gospel, but every year is a different theme. Maybe it's about living pure. Maybe it's about how to develop real friendship. Maybe it's how to, how to deal with your parents and what the Bible has to say about all those topics. But then try to also be very creative with videos and comedy and interactivity and, and that kind of thing. And then always a call to go to the nations as well. So we started taking more and more kids on mission trips each year. 
uh, we'd take hundreds and then thousands. Over over all the years, we took some eighty thousand young people on mission trips, and we had an internship in um, Garden Valley, Texas. And of course, you got to come and speak to those interns. At one point, we had hundreds of young people there giving a year of their life. And um, so, I, I, in retrospect, so I'm doing everything I can uh, to, you know, r- rescue these kids and reach them for Christ and. If we figured if we took them on a, a mission trip and then an internship, we'd get them so deep in their faith they wouldn't backslide. Um, however, now in retrospect, I think, first of all, I don't think we had three million kids come because we were such great marketers. What a symptom of what's happening to the church in America. That is, people are gasping for air, youth groups are dying, and they're looking for anywhere that can give them CPR. So they would come to our event you know, trying to get their young people on fire again. And so I think we have a phenomenon like that in, in America now where yeah. it's like the Walmart effect. Something looks big, but it's actually because other things are dying. And, uh, you know, when you look at the percentage of Christians in America, the number of people going to church, percentage of young people coming to Christ or that, know, that call themselves Christians, it's getting less and less and less, no matter what we do. And for the last four decades, five decades. And so... Um, so I've been studying the last five years, how do we have real answers to change the trend rather than keep doing the same thing and hoping for different results? Yeah, well said. And thank God for the good fruit that did come out of this. Uh, our younger daughter uh, went, I believe it was to Romania with Teen Mania, oh, was really impacted. Right? And, and what I remember, uh, she, uh, she and, and her older sister, her older daughter, had some, some friends in the congregation and one of the girls was kind of, she was probably in the faith, but she was, she was not really deeply committed. And she was in Africa. I'm almost sure she was in Africa on, on her missions trip. And it, it was for about a month. And she had tickets to a U2 concert. And she, uh, she called her mom and dad said, she said, I've got to, I've got to see more souls saved. I've got to stay. So she stayed that extra month. But I remember just hearing that, thinking, "Wow, oh, wow!" Well, and that that fire burned in her for many years. You know, you can't you can't make something burn a whole lifetime. But when someone gets touched and years and years they're living by that, that's that's major. But yeah, I I think that often we fail to look at the big picture. Ron, we 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 see a, a hole in the dam and we stick one thumb in now with another finger and now. But we've already used all the all the fingers and all the toes. So something else has to happen. So tell us what, what you have discovered as some of the main issues. We're going to talk solutions, friends, today. But what are some of the main problems that you are uncovering in your studies? Well, so my studies uh, were in strategic foresight. I did my doctorate at Regent University, finished a couple of years ago. And that's the science of futuring. It's identifying trends and looking at how they might impact a variety of different industries. So I went in studying what are the trends in the next 5, 10, 20 years that are going to most impact the church, and what can we do about it? And by the way, of course, those trends will most impact the younger generation because they'll impact them and they'll live for the rest of their life with that trend. Mm-hmm. And so some of some of what we've seen that is, is not new, but when you start connecting the dots, it becomes a, uh, a uh, kind of inflection point that makes you pause. So, for example— one of the big trends we identified that uh, is uh, frightening or um, daunting is the aging of the church or the graying of the church, both in America and around the world, where you look at what is the average age of, of those who are Christians or call themselves Christians, and it's been getting older and older, and all around the world we documented it, where almost every single place that has been Christianized is getting older and older, and it only means that Youth ministry in America and around the world, um, we're just reaching less and less percentage, and so there's less in church. And so you have a in, in South Korea, they've closed ten thousand yeah. churches in the last ten years yeah. because everybody was old and died, you know. And so one of the metrics that uh, that we haven't been paying attention to because we we look at like, hey, how big is or, you know, how many campuses do we have? Or, you know, how, what, how, big, open, how big is the back door and the front door of the church? Do we, do we grow 2 or 3%? But one of the uh, dashboard, the gauges we're not looking at on the dashboard is, what is the average age of our church? And what does it look like six months ago or a year ago? What's the trend? 
because it's sort of that gauge gets hidden. And as a result, churches are getting older and older and literally slowly dying. So, so you start reverse engineering going, now why would that be? We, we in youth ministry, if you are a youth pastor, you've been involved in, there's lots of parachurch ministries. We were one. Um, you can't say people haven't been working hard. People have been working really hard. But it, some of the things that we discover that are sort of right in our face that we just don't see are paradigms that do not help us in the quest for the next generation, for example. Um, so we've known for a long time. Kids come back from college and they go, well, I'm, I'm not going. That's not my church. That's my pa- my parents' church. That's my pastor. That's my parents' pastor. 70 or 80 percent after they get done with college don't come back to church. And we go, wow, isn't that sad? And then we just keep doing the same thing. Well, if we look at the paradigm underneath that is, so you hire a cool guy with a little tattoo. He plays guitar, and he keeps the kids' attention for three years before he leaves. So for those years while he's there, he's the kids or the youth you, uh, pastor, as it were. He's speaking into their lives. And many times they're not even in the Sunday morning service for the pastor to plant nuggets into their life. Mm. So they come back from college and they go, well, my, my pastor's gone, the guy that was the cool guy with the tattoo. And so that guy on stage, that's not my pastor. He never, I, I didn't get any, anything planted in my life from him. And so they start wondering, that's my parents' pastor. And the, the pastor doesn't know what to do, so he just, because of the paradigm, just go hire the next guy with the, the cool guy that can keep your attention. And so they're literally paying people's salary to actually cause people to leave their church, and they don't even realize it because they think they're doing the responsible thing, hiring a youth pastor, and youth pastors are great, except that the pastor needs to be the pastor of the whole church and have some spiritual deposit so that, that young person feels an affinity to them. That, that person has changed my life. A lot of pastors, you know, they feel like I'm not cool, I'm not relatable, I don't know what to say. That's why I hired a, a cool guy. And instead of realizing you don't have to be young and cool, what you just need to be is honest and real and just try whatever sermon you have to make – think of that 15-year-old sitting in your pew and just make one illustration for your message each week that will apply to that girl or that guy and so they know you're thinking about them. And so there's a lot of uh, – a, a, a number of paradigms like that that – have caused this uh, the graying of the church. Work. Yeah. All right. Tell you what, yeah. we'll stay right here. We got a break. So much to unpack here, friends. Again, we're going to identify some of the problems. They're, here they are. They're the elephants in the room, but there are solutions. Be forewarned. The solutions are as radical as the Jesus of the Bible. We'll be right back with Ron Luce, Dr. Ron Luce. What is the meaning of shalom? Is it just peace? Is it more than peace? When you greet someone in modern Hebrew, when you say, hey, how you doing? It's mashlamcha, which is literally how is or what is your peace? Uh, How are you doing? But we use the word shalom there broadly. When you greet someone, shalom, when you leave, shalom. So it, it can have so many different meanings in modern Hebrew, but biblical Hebrew, what, is, what does it mean? Well, the root primarily does not have to do with peace, but with completeness or wholeness. A, a part of the root can be used for, for, for repaying or something like that, recompense. So the word itself is not about rest or peace as much as, as fullness, wholeness, completeness. And, and hence, shalom is overall well-being. It is wholeness of, of life, wholeness of mind, body, spirit. A beautiful verse in Isaiah, the 26th chapter, it, it says this, and, and I'll quote it in Hebrew, Yetzer, Yetzer Samuch, Titzor Shalom Shalom Kivacha Batuach. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind and stayed in you because he trusts in you. Perfect peace in Hebrew is Shalom, Shalom. So Shalom is not just peace, but well-being. It is wholeness. It is not so much fullness in the sense of overflowing. There are other words for that. But the life that is blessed is a life at shalom. So it is peace because all is well. The false prophets would say shalom, shalom, ve'en shalom. They'd say all is well, all is well, when nothing is well. To say 
Shalom, it's all good. It is well with my soul. That's really the heart essence of shalom. And for a whole people, that's what it's talking about. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Hey, friends, a little less than one hour from now, so 4.15 Eastern Time, We'll be right back here on YouTube. So those watching on YouTube, those listening on radio, you can switch over ASK DR Brown on YouTube at 415 for our weekly exclusive Q&A chat. So all subjects under the sun, you get to post questions. I answer as many as I can. All right, getting back to my guest, Dr. Ron Luce. Uh, Ron, I've had the privilege of ministering in South Korea Uh, since 1990. I think I've been there 13 times, and I I never met anyone that prays the way they pray. I remember one pastor with a network of about 70,000 that he was over. I was speaking for him, and he told me that uh, for many, many years, decades, he's led the 6 a.m. prayer meeting at his church and the early morning prayer at 4.30 a.m., and uh, that was just his lifestyle never seen that level of praying devotion. But as I went in more recent years, I thought, oh my, I mean, I see it with my eyes. Oh my, the graying of the church and where are the young people and the the numbers, I was reading about them and hearing about them. And you think, wow, it, it, it's so burdensome and so grievous because of the fervor and because of the commitment. But we often just do the same thing over and again, at least here in America, thinking that that's somehow gonna solve the problem. What else have you identified in terms of especially young people leaving? You, you said a lot already, and I want to talk about some of the solutions, but what else did you learn in your doctoral studies? Well, uh, let's just continue to talk about uh, Korea for just a second. So what an amazing revival. We uh, Most of us have heard about it in the 70s and 80s, went from 2% Christian to 33% Christian in a Buddhist nation. Now, I don't know if that's ever happened before in the history of Christianity. That's amazing. And so when you're in the middle of that kind of miracle, it's probably hard to have your wits about you, right? They're doing their best. Their churches are growing millions and millions and millions, all these different churches, Cho and everybody else. Um, So before casting a stone or anything, I've I've not been in the middle of that. I can't really relate to that. However, um, today we know the data says that of young people in in Korea, it's only 1.7% that are Christian. Mm. It's actually less than before the revival. Yeah. And so uh, it, it's about, and, and for, for pastors, you know, I'm not advocating you need to turn your whole church into a youth church, but I am saying if you just tilt your sail a little bit, like what could you do? Like you end up on a whole different part of the ocean if you just tilt your sail. If they would have just aimed a little bit at young people, all of the praying, all of that that the stuff that they've done for all these decades now may have been able to really impact. And now, of course, they've got the prosperity that's going on there, and people have left the church because of that, and they've got K-pop and all kinds of things. And so I would say that um, uh, it, diving deep into why the grain of the church helps to bring solutions. And so in the middle of my studies, as I'm looking at things like technology and all the futuring of things that are happening so quickly, and we can barely keep our mind wrapped around, wow, TikTok, it's everywhere, and then all of a sudden there's something else, and then there's virtual reality and all of this, and how can you compete with that? And it feels like we're being flooded with all the high-tech stuff that's shaping and influencing our kids, and um, and really, even in Christian homes, stealing them from us because they spend way more time with the, with the technology and the media and the social media than they, than they do at church or even with their parents. And so I found, though... Uh, a glimpse of hope. And then I found another. And then I found another that was defined, that is defined all the trends, the technology trends, the grade of the church trends, and all the other trends that have been, that are negative or pulling the young generation from uh, Christ. And they're they're doing things. When I first saw it in Singapore, then I saw it in the Philippines, saw it in uh, uh, Africa and Ghana, saw it in Bogota, Colombia, and Russia, a few other places. I was like, oh my gosh, this I, I'm so ashamed and embarrassed. I've been used to, we work with 100,000 churches around America, and I've never saw what I've seen in these churches. They are defying the odds of uh, 
the church growing old. They're, they're actually growing their church young by reaching the young generation. They're reaching them, and as a result, that's their strategy to grow their church because they base their strategies on data. So, for example, we all know there's been studies for decades that say most people come to Christ before 20. Some da- uh, show up to 90% come before 20. International Bible Society says 83% come to Christ between 4 and 14 years old. That's all around the world. Now, that's not new data, yep. but we haven't used it, we the church, to inform our actions. We just kind of have keep doing, well, oh, that's good, because we have this conundrum. And the conundrum is, well, Jesus loves everybody, so shouldn't I try to reach everybody? And then, well, like a shotgun, we try to reach everybody, and we reach very few of anybody. But um, Jesus was focused. So think about when he was here alive in person. Um, he loved everybody, but he still spent more time with the 70s in the crowd, spent more time with the 12 than the 70s, spent more time with the 3s and the 12. That is, he, he focused and he prioritized people that were more receptive. And so he still loved everybody, and we can do this. We can chew gum and walk at the same time. We can love everybody, but focus on those most likely to come to Christ. And that's what we found in Singapore and so many churches, uh, these exponential churches we found around the world. They, they, anybody's welcome, but they focus on the sweet spot between 13 and 19 years old. Um, you can't really get to them when they're children unless you got side wreck Sunday school or vacation Bible school. But at 13, there's a little bit of a – uh, a chance for them to make their own decisions. I'm going to go to the movies with my friends, things like that. And so Pastor Howe in Singapore was the first one who told me. He says, Ron, we, we focus on every 13-year-old in our footprint. I said, footprint? What are you talking about? You sound like a businessman because that's marketing language. He goes, I'm not talking about every 13-year-old in our church. Of course we're going to reach those. I'm talking about we identify every school represented in our church. We find out how many 13-year-olds are in those schools. And we go after those 13-year-olds. That's our footprint because we're going to reach them sometimes when they get 16, 17, 18. You know, they're cool. They're driving. Maybe they're drinking. They got girlfriends. They're distracted. They don't want to get caught. And a lot of energy is spent on trying to catch kids who don't want to get caught. But 13-year-olds want to get caught. They're sort of in this, uh, this moment of, well, what am I? I'm not a child. I'm not an adult. And if we're not careful, we'll let social media kind of uh, – you give them their identity, and they're the ones looking like, who will accept me? Is it the cool kids? Is it the druggies? Is it the jocks? And usually the church is running right by them. Well, these churches are focused on They're going to get a couple times a year. They do a big event and a big push. Everybody find a 13-year-old, play for a 13-year-old, bring a niece or a nephew, go make friends with one, and get them to this event. And it's a slap your mama, God's in the house, throw down the gospel, call to Christ, and that's one of the best practices that we found, we've identified a handful of best practices that all these churches do. One is they aim for them while they're in their sweet spot, while they're most likely to come to Christ. In most Western countries, it's about 13 years old. In Japan, it's a little bit older. They really can't get to them before they're 18 because their culture and that kind of thing. Second, an, another best practice is they, they uh, once they come to Christ, this is really important, they take them on a deep dive. We call it deep dive discipleship. You know, in America, we throw that word around, discipleship. You know, it's the four classes you take after you get saved. But they have a whole different way of thinking about it. They, um, they think we're going we're gonna to put them in a pipeline when they're 13, and we're going to put a pipeline together that goes all the way through 14, 15, 16, until they get to 20 or 21 years old. In fact, what they do is they think deeply about what do we want them to look like when they get to be 21, and then they reverse engineer it. And then they scope and sequence it just like you would a school or university. Well, where do they need to be in their faith at 14 and then 15 and 16? And then they have trimesters, all of them. Like you think kids won't do this, but they will. We know young people love radical message. The problem is only radical message a lot of times they hear is at camp or at Acquire the Fire or a conference. They don't hear it regularly. And so what they do is they, they put this whole discipleship pipeline together that's all radical, infused with gospel, the truth, scripture, renewing your mind, and and shaping them into the young men and women. So some of these guys have been doing it for like 20 years. Now they've, they're in each other's weddings, they're godparents to each other's kids, and they solve that issue. What, are they, what happens when they graduate? It's not one sermon that does it. It's a paradigm of radical growth. Think about Red Bull for your faith. Red Bull, Red Bull, Red Bull for like six years. And at the third best practice that they all do is some kind of a uh, leadership training for young people. So once they're a disciple for a year, then they put them into leadership training because the assumed close is everybody's going to lead a small group. 
everybody's going to get to lead. Everybody's going to get to pray for people and minister to people because that's part of the fun, right? Jesus invited us all and, and commissioned us all to get involved in the Great Commission and ministry to people. And so uh, the assumed close is everybody's going to get to have the fun and lead and mm. help people on their, and guide them in their growth in Christ. And so it, it's a really it's life-giving, but it's also very systemic. They're training leaders all the time. They're having uh, big events a couple times a year um, for young people, for 13-year-olds, and then they have this deep-dive discipleship that goes trimester one is 12 weeks, and then another trimester is 12 weeks, another trimester is 12 weeks. And some of them have scoped and sequenced all the way those six or seven years until they get 21. And so you can, it's, a, it's a sticky web of goodness. You can get out, but you got to really want to get out yeah. because you're stuck to this and you don't want to get out. Uh, yeah, Ron, there, uh, I, I want to interact with, with some of this on the other side of the break. This is so rich. Uh, friends, if if you're in a church and you think, wow, this is awesome to hear this, send this to your pastor, youth pastor, pastors, youth pastors listening, others involved in all types of youth ministry, evangelists, hear these words. This, this is so, so important. Ron, we've got a break in 15 seconds. Is there a website of yours that folks can go to to find out more about what you're doing today? Sure. Generationnext.me.me. You can find out all about the tools I just mentioned. And we actually have a whole program called Project 13 for churches that are interested in doing Incredible. it in their church. So generationnext.me. All right, friends, write that down. Generationnext.me. We'll be right back with Ron Luce. Okay, if, if there's one church, one body in God's sight, and if God works through local churches, that's his family, that's his body, right? What about parachurch organizations? What about ministries like, like this? Ask Dr. Brown, yes, I'm part of a local congregation, right? But this is a, a ministry or a ministry like World Vision or something like that. Ministries like that, parachurches, is, is this part of the church, an evangelistic association? Look, uh, Ephesians chapter 4 Verse 4 says this. It's written in Ephesians 4, 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. Now, some would say, look, everything has to be part of the church body. There's one body, and it's expressed in local assemblies all over, and therefore, you have to be part of that. So if you have a parachurch ministry, it has to be part of a local church, and it comes out from that local church. Now, I respect that view. And I believe all of us should be part of assemblies of believers, unless it's impossible for us physically to join with other believers. We, we need to find other believers, join together with them, be in fellowship together, and everyone should have a structure of authority where they themselves are submitted to authority. And if you have a ministry and organization, that's submitted to authority. But, but, but I look at this really the exact opposite. We're all part of the body. We're, we're, all, we're all part of the, the body, the ecclesia, the, the church, if we're believers. So whatever I'm doing, S. Dr. Brown Ministries, that's just an extension of the body. The Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, Samaritan's Purse, this is just extension of the body, different expressions of the body. So individuals, I mean, what exists are individuals. And as individuals, we are all part of the Messiah's body. And we are all, should be on one level or another, in submission to authority, okay? That's, that's part of it. Every, every one of us, in that sense, under authority, under accountability. And the same thing that whatever organization you have, just like a business, you're going to have accountability there and order and structure. But this is just an expression of my calling as an individual believer, just as Samaritan's Purse is an expression of Franklin Graham's calling or, or World Vision is an extension of one calling or Youth with a Mission, extension of, of the calling of Lauren Cunningham or Campus Crusade, which is now Crew, extension of the calling of Bill Bright. So it's parachurch. Of course, even to call it parachurch, I understand what's meant 
It's not, it's not an extension of just one local church, but come on, you're not going to have every local church creating all kinds of ministries that are going to go around the world. These are going to be things that we do jointly in a larger effort, all as part of the body, because there's only one body. So I think we're looking at this wrong. I think we need to look at everything as coming out of the one body, and as individuals, we're all part of local assemblies meeting with other believers. To me, pretty basic and simple. Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the line of fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. During the break, I was over at generationnext.me. Boy, what a catchy website. Revolutionary executive education for pastors and their team, Exponential 101. We'll talk about that with my guest, Dr. Ron Luce. You know, Ron, you trigger so many thoughts as you're talking. I just want to say a few things and give it back to you. But uh, I interact every so often with Andy Stanley, and we have a lot of areas of agreement. And then here and there, we'll have some, some friendly sparring on areas of disagreement. Something he said that's really stuck with me as one of the most influential pastors in America, that his target when he's preaching is a 15 to 16 year old. And that what excites him the most is when his teenagers are eager to get to church. They don't want to miss a church service. That to him is the biggest thing. And I think back to when I got saved in 1971 at the age of 16 as a heroin shooting LSD using hippie rock drummer. It was a totally traditional church, little Italian Pentecostal church. Pastor's wife played the piano. We sang the hymns. Uh, there was nothing youth-oriented about it. There wasn't a youth group, anything like that. A bunch of us got saved around the same time. But, and, and there was very little formal discipleship. But if you wanted to dive in, there was Monday night prayer meeting. There was Tuesday night service. There was Friday night service. There was Sunday school. There was Sunday morning. Then we added a Wednesday night service. Then we added a Sunday night service. Then we did uh, door-to-door outreach, different things. So I got involved with everything. And at a certain point, I remember I said to myself, because I got instantly set free from drugs by, by God's grace, I said, I could lead a clean but empty life where I could give myself to God the way I gave myself to drugs and rock music. And by the time I was saved a year, I used to spend at least six or seven hours alone with God in the Word and prayer, undistracted, uninterrupted, And those things laid foundations for the rest of my life. So even though there was not a conscious youth discipleship, there was at least a funnel where those who are hungry and thirsty could join together with other committed believers, older believers, and we we went after Jesus together. What you're saying is doing things in a systematic, intentional way. We look at the young people and the radicality of what they're exposed to And we come up with this idea to just try to entertain them in church, which is ridiculous. What we need to show is following Jesus is a radical thing. Are you willing to go? We'll run with you. And I get spoiled because I'm in so many places where young people are on fire, where churches are growing, where they're largely young. Then I get to pour into the the cream of the crop that go to ministry schools for more training. And and I realize, okay, that's not what's happening all around. I I can't base things on what I'm seeing because I'm seeing some of the the exceptions, you're looking at the larger figures, which are very, very daunting. More and more people are recognizing now. So before we get into any more of these best practices, Ron, in your experience now in America, are pastors and leaders able to take hold of this? You mentioned Singapore, you mentioned Philippines, you mentioned countries in Africa. Uh, are, Are pastors in America able to take hold of this and actually do this here in the U.S.? Well, um, that is a great question because a lot of times we'll see things going on in other nations. Well, well that happens in America. Well, that only happens in South America. And so uh, I finally met a pastor that uh, had actually gone on the same quest that I was on, learning from these churches, many of the same churches in uh, Los Angeles. And he came back home and uh, he goes, Okay, I've learned all this stuff. Now, what is it about America that makes it so that uh, there's barriers to applying this? For example, uh, we like to be anonymous in church. Uh, we're too busy for another meeting, like a small group or something. Um, we don't want authority in our life. In Los Angeles, one of the barriers is it's hard to get anybody anywhere because public transportation, you wouldn't let your young person go on that necessarily. And so he took all the barriers to say, okay, why do the barriers, can we take the principles 
that had been curated and apply them. And he's done it, and it's been amazing. It's, his name is Jason Lozano. His church went from 1,700 to 3,000 in two years, and then COVID has gone to 4,900. And these are people that are not just coming to Christ, but they're all involved. He's got 10 simultaneous trimesters going on at the same time of growth, 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 growth. And so uh, there is good news, and I think hope for pastors, because there are a lot of pastors who, they've tried a lot. They used to be youth pastors, and now they're pastors, and they're like, you know, we put a lot of money into this, we built a youth center, we did all this stuff, and we're, we're still seeing all this negative data. Well, now there is hope. Like, there's a proven process. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, uh, every industry in the world goes and finds out what the best practices are in their industry, bring it back. You can't cheat and just copy and paste. You still have to personalize it. You say, well, how does this apply to my DNA of my church, to my community, to my culture, things like that. So you can't just be, you know, a no-brainer about it. But at the same time, you can you can take the, the best practices and the, and the principles behind them and say, okay, now how will that work in my context? And so, yeah, we've what we tried to do is take something, as I kept learning, I went to every one of these churches, looked under the hood, asked a lot of questions about the pastor and the levels of leadership, and then thought, okay, now how do we take this? It's, it's sophisticated and it's deep and it's working and make it simple for a pastor or youth pastor who says, you know what, I'm ready for a fresh paradigm. And so, uh, as I mentioned, we, we call this approach Project 13 because we're getting the churches and the, uh, the youth pastors to focus on reaching doesn't mean the whole church is about 13-year-olds, but you're reaching them a couple times a year. And so kind of we've got our it, – it's as simple as three things. They're training young leaders. They're doing an epic event a couple times a year just for 13-year-olds, and you rally the church around that. And then you take them on a deep-dive discipleship journey. And uh, so it's, it's simple, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, imper- it's a different paradigm. It's not – event oriented please come i'll shave my head please come you know all these crazy antics that youth pastors would do to get kids to come it is it is a process driven rather than event driven uh system and so uh let me just take a moment tell you a little bit more because maybe a listener is thinking like what is this deep dive like like you know jesus died for your sin what else do you need to know kind of thing. <laughs> go ahead well, that's the problem that's the problem is like if, are we just trying to get them into heaven, or are we trying to make them lifelong followers of Christ? Because I think we've, we've settled for just pray the prayer and go to heaven, rather than we want people to be hardcore followers of Christ for the rest of their life. Yep. And we better make sure, first of all, that we present the gospel, we're presenting it that way. We're not just getting out a hell-free card you know, that we're passing out at the altar, but we're like inviting them to become followers of Christ just like he did. That's the most common way Jesus himself talked about how to, a human gets connected to his Father. Follow me. He said it 32 times throughout the gospel. I'll make you fishers of men. Take up your cross and follow me. And so what does that really mean? So we unpack that. So what we did to help churches adopt or you know, just add water to a deep dive discipleship is we actually put a whole series of materials together based on what we saw worked the best with our interns. We had 7,000 interns over the years. We had all these young people come to these events, and we would pass out um, – uh, different devotional books afterwards. And let me tell you, uh, Dr. Brown, the, the one that worked the best, uh, when I say this, when I say worked the best, the one I had the most comments on over all the years uh, was a book that I did called uh, Ten Challenges of a World Changer. And this is a hard book, a lot of scripture to memorize, something to do every day in your quiet time, you write stuff down. More than any other book, about 100,000 kids got that. Came, people came back to me and said, like five years, 10 years later, brought the book, filled all... It's all filled out 10 years ago. This changed my life. I've never been the same. So we took that same premise and put together a whole series of materials. We have the whole first year done called Pathway to Freedom. And so we've got trimester one, two, and three done. And, and they, they're books. Well, they're, they're disguised as books. They're not really books. They're tools to help young people keep following Jesus every day. Two or three pages each day to do in their quiet time, verses for them to read, stuff for them to write down. And at the end of each week, there's a small group discussion. And so the church, we've got training materials for them to train young leaders to lead small groups. At the end of each week, they lead a discussion with these small groups. They don't have to teach anything. They're just facilitating, like, what will speak to you? What can we pray for? And we're teaching young people on multi-levels here. We're teaching them to have a connection with Jesus every day, 
and let him speak to you, write stuff down. We're teaching him to do life around a group. You don't do life alone. You're not a lone wolf anymore. Uh, we're teaching him uh, to read through the Bible. And so there's a chapter of the Bible to read every day in their quiet time. By the time they're done with the first year, they've read the entire New Testament and Proverbs and then asked, you know, the, reflected on the question, what did the Lord speak to you in that chapter? And so we're teaching them from the very moment they come to the altar. This is what we do. This is normal for followers of Christ. We follow Jesus every day. And we're not perfect, but we keep growing and growing. The first trimester it, um, is all about um, uh, what Jesus has to say about every area of your life. It's all about felt needs. It's a little bit anti, a little par- paradoxical because most people think, well, discipleship, you need to know why Jesus had to die for your sin and all that. And that's important. That comes in trimester two. But if you're still hurting so bad and you're still alone and you want to end your life, it, doesn't, you, it might not do you any good to know Jesus, what, he's the Son of God, and you can prove it um, if you're hurting so bad. So we're going to teach them that whole first trimester, all the practical, most urgent issues that young people deal with, how Jesus helps you walk through those things, and you're doing it in the context of a small group. So then the second trimester is how to build your whole life on a solid foundation. The third trimester is teaching them to, to learn to become mature and beginning of leadership training in character and things so that after they've become a, been a Christian for a year, then they start getting trained as a leader so they can lead a small group. They continue in their group, but they're also leading the group and helping other people in their faith. And so we scoped and sequenced it all the way through the year 21 years old. So a pastor can look at this and go, I don't, I don't have to invent this all from scratch. Maybe there's one trimester I want to do in the DNA of my church. Great, that's awesome. Or I've got some my own leadership stuff. That's great, do that. But you don't have to invent it from, from nothing, and it, it's there for you. And so when we say, well, we don't know what to do, how do we reach the young generation? It's not splitting the atom. This is not rocket science. And there are some hard things to do in the world and in the kingdom, but this is not. It's right in the Bible. Churches are already doing it, and now we've made it just add water with Project 13 so people can 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 start training their leaders, planning their first big event, and then uh, taking young people on a deep dive discipleship. Yeah, that that is so massively valuable, Ron. Because often I'll see I can I can stir people to action. I can get them to lay their lives down on the altar for the kingdom. And then the question is, okay, what next? And and along with okay, keep meeting with God. It's like, well, how do I meet with God? And what do I do next? And one of the healthiest, most rapid growing churches I know in America, the, the whole key for their success has been taking people from corporate encounters to daily encounters. They put tools in their hands for the whole body to say, here's how you connect on a daily basis. So friends, go to generationnext.me. The hard work has been done for you. Generationnext.me. we got one more segment. Wish I had even more time. One more segment with Dr. Ron Luce. Stay right here. We live in an on-demand world, time, weather, meals, and content. That's why the Truth Network has the Truth Podcast Network, some of your favorite Truth Network programs, plus some that are podcast only. Rich content that is rich. There's nothing more central for the follower okay, of Jesus if, if than the resurrection. Church, one body there's nothing more important sight. than that fundamental question, did he rise churches, from the dead family, or not? Body, In fact, right? it's so strong. First what Corinthians 15, Paul was dealing with questions about the resurrection of the like, dead like this, in general. Brian, he says this, if there's no resurrection right, of the dead, a, a ministry, then not even like Christ has been raised. So if there's no future resurrection, the dead aren't raised, then he wasn't raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is in vain. So if he didn't rise, four, throw the whole thing out. This. Throw the Bible Ephesians out, throw our four, faith four. out, throw it all there out. So the big question is, can I spirit, prove just as you that he rose? Yes and no. Yes 
in my now, own life, a hundred percent. Everything has to be in the lives of, the of hundreds of millions of Christians, a hundred percent. In other words, we have experienced the reality of his resurrection. Of that. I know so that, that I know ministry, that I know that he rose from the dead. He has changed my life. He has revealed himself through the cross. He has set me free from the sins that bound me. I commune with him. I know him. I love him. He is risen. Yes, he lives within my heart because he has risen from the dead. And if you'll truly cry out to God to and earnestly seek him for the truth, he will make that authority. truth known to you but, but and he will reveal really his son opposite. to you as well. However, I cannot we're, we're demonstrate the, the the in an the, the absolute church, way that so he rose from doing, the dead Esther to the satisfaction of a skeptic or mocker or even Billy someone with serious questions. I can give person. very strong, plausible evidence that he body, rose from the dead. I can explain so that the resurrection from the dead is the best way to understand what happened and the only logical way to understand what happened in history. Body. I can give and you very, very strong, plausible evidence. But to, to know for you sure, okay? for absolute... Eight six six three four truth here again is Dr. Michael Brown. What a joy to spend a full hour with Dr. Ron Luce, generationnext.me. Friends, a little less than 30 minutes from now, 4.15 Eastern time. I'll be back on YouTube, ASK Dear Brown. Ask Dr. Brown on YouTube for our weekly Q&A chat. So be sure to join us there. Ron, there's a ministry that I've worked with that works with kids even younger and spends time does trips with them, of course, all with parental blessing and approval and all of this. But what amazed me was to see how quickly these kids would, would grow in spiritual things and were like sponges and had confidence to pray for people. And, and obviously, they're, they're, they weren't being put in positions of authority, but just as, as, as kids grabbing hold of these things and being used, it, it was amazing to see Ron, I, I want to do one thing before we, we wrap this up. You've had your eye on young people much more closely than most of us for decades. Youth suicide, young people getting exposed to porn, gender confusion, kids being born in divorced homes, other things like that. I, I, I want to give one more wake-up call before you close with some practical thoughts, but how bad is it today right now for young people in America? Well, we found, of course, we've known this for a long time, that young uh, parents, as soon as they get a 13-year-old, they're like out of their mind because they know it's crazy compared to when they were 13 and a lot of frustration of not knowing what to do. So think about uh, it used to be back in the day, uh, oh, don't watch too much TV. Well, now we've got so much screen time, so many crazy, perverted, weird things influencing our kids. It's hard to keep track of all that. Obviously, there's a lot of technology and things that can be done, but honestly, it feels like it's too overwhelming. Yep. Who can fight, you know, MTV? Who can fight TikTok? Who can fight LGBTQ? I mean, who can? How can you really keep that from like influencing and your kids being immersed in it? I love a quote from Tim Keller. He wrote an article about a year ago. He said, "At the rate that the world is now evangelizing our kids, just coming to church and youth group once a week is not enough. Yep. They're stealing them." But they have too much influence. And so what what I would say, back to the metaphor, the pipeline metaphor, once you get, put a young person in a pipeline of discipleship, think about this. You, you get them they, – they, um, it, it's a norm for them to regularly, aggressively go on Christ. So, in fact, right now we're working on a, on a, on a trimester called Pathway to Manhood and Pathway to Womanhood because one sermon about LGBTQ will not teach them to see through the lies. You can't even do a series. They need to really take a deep dive of what the Bible has to say. And once they're used to you, in a pipeline, you're protected from the element. Things like uh, that. There are other things that you can train them. Some of the things you just talked about, like suicide and things like this. These are all symptoms of challenges because you know they're comparing themselves to the Instagram models and all of that kind of stuff. One sermon doesn't deal with that. Sure, one touch from God can touch their heart, but they need to have their mind renewed and rethink. They're thinking how they think about life and the world. You can't do that with one sermon a week, one youth group meeting a week. But when you take them on a on a deep dive, like how to get your self esteem from the scripture and from Jesus, because He calls you beautifully and wonderfully made. You know, uh, it and you're you've got scripture.
scripture that they're memorizing, and you've got reinforcement people around a small group that are praying for them. You you solve the problem rather than just put a Band-Aid on and a Band-Aid on and another Band-Aid on and another Band-Aid on. So I would just say uh, my hope for parents that are listening, for churches that are listening, is that um, let's play the long game. Let's not just try to have a big youth group this week, but let's like reach them and then take them on a on a deep dive of growth so that by the time they arrive at 20 years old, they've been discipling others for six years. They're strong in their character. One of the things we're doing, working on a trimester right now is teaching to be critical thinkers. So think about this. We know the smartphone has made everybody dumb, especially the young generation. They don't have to memorize anything. Siri knows everything. And so it's not just that they don't know, but that they can't process. So now you've got to get people from other countries to come lead big companies here because they aren't deep processors and and critical thinkers. What if the followers of Christ, we taught them a whole trimester on how to critically think about life, about culture, about everything. Mm -hmm. And so they become the mayors and the CEOs and all the leaders of culture because they're the only Americans that can critically think. So anyways, there's a lot that you can do when you've got them in a pipeline of growth. And I just want to encourage any pastors or youth pastors listening, um, if you go to Generation uh, uh, next.me, or if you could email me directly at ronluce100 at gmail.com, and we'll send you uh, a Project 13 assessment. It'll kind of sh- uh, give us enough information to tell us whether you're ready to be one of the early adopters. We've got about a, a dozen of them around the country right now that are that are actively engaged right now in the whole premise that I just described here. And if you're interested in, in uh, maybe being one of those early adopter churches, um, just Hit me up with an email. Go to the website, ronloose100 at gmail.com, and you answer about a dozen questions there, and we can talk about it, whether uh, it might be right for your church and, uh, you know, your sphere of influence. Yeah, this is, I mean, it's super encouraging to hear, Ron, the, the practical steps. That's that's what is so critically important, because people want to know, how do I do it? And and the idea of, of a pastor now having to reinvent the wheel Come up with a whole new program, a whole new curriculum. And it's it's overwhelming. But here you've you've put the tools right. together, uh, and and that's that's what I understand to be so super super critical. And there's great hope. I I live with tremendous hope because I see people who are hungry. I see young people who are hungry. I, I remember Ron getting ready for the call DC. We were both there, uh, September second of mm-hmm. two thousand. But I remember getting ready for that, and one of the young men working on it said to me, "This is over twenty years ago." Give me a cause and I'll die for it because we don't have anything to live for. If you give me a cause, I'll die for it. When I got saved in the 60s, uh, or, or 1971, but I was part of the whole counterculture revolution of the 60s, yeah, it was sex, drugs, rock and roll, Eastern religion, all the, all the sin, but we were looking for something. We were against the war in Vietnam. We knew there had to be more than what's happening you know, the American dream, we knew there had to be more. We just went the wrong direction and got a full-blown rebellion. I look at young people today. I, l- I look at young people becoming LGBT activists. I look pe- look at people getting absorbed with, with BLM and Antifa and different things. And I think, okay, they want to see a better world. They're going about it the wrong mm-hmm. way, but they want justice. They, they want to side with the underdog. They, they have a certain thing that's right. It's just getting expressed in a wrong way. If we can join that that hunger, that thirst, that that loneliness, that recognition that something's wrong, get it past the Marxist utopia myth and, and get them plugged into Jesus in a holistic way, America could be turned around. So, Ron, would you do this? We've got two minutes. Would you just pray for pastors, leaders to, to take hold of this, that, that God would raise up a generation that would shake America for his glory? Would you pray for us? Sure. Jesus, we just ask that you would uh, just deposit hope in the hearts of pastors right now, youth leaders, even parents that are listening. Lord, I've seen it around the world. Lord, I've seen churches thriving with half their church under 20 years old, Lord, because they've been disciples for so long. I know it's real. I know it can happen. Lord, I pray that you would open up our hearts to a new paradigm, a new way of approaching it. We just take all the energy and all the sweat and all the money we're already spending, but reallocate it in a way that will just be more fruitful, Lord. Help us to be wise stewards of our influence, of our time, of our money, and of the next generation, Lord, that we wouldn't just be people that 
talk about it, but we actually, whether church is big or small, it doesn't matter. We actually do something to rescue, reach, and disciple the next generation. Guide us and use us, inspire us in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. 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 Hey, Ron, thanks for what you're doing. Thanks for joining us on the air. And I want to stand side Thank by you, side to see the greatest things we've ever seen in our entire lives. God bless you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, friends, one more time, generationnext.me. Uh, I, I hope you got as much out of that as I did. Uh, again, share this with your pastors, with your youth pastors. It's not a criticism. Some of the churches are thriving, and you've got healthy young people. It, it's coming alongside to help. Just as I do every day, I'm, I'm coming alongside to help. And pastors and leaders and others will say, thank you for the article that really helped. Well, I, I'm called to do that research. I'm called to put certain things together for radio. So I, I can specialize there because I'm not a pastor. And I don't have to deal with the, the daily burdens and responsibilities of a pastor. I don't have to work on the things that a youth pastor has to work on. So I, I can work on other things and be your voice for moral sanity and spiritual clarity and be here to infuse you with, with faith and truth and courage wise so you can stand strong. So here, Ron Luce has put together the material, the curriculum, the strategy, the, the tools. And, and uh, boy, I'm excited about what God's going to do with this young generation. So take advantage of those resources. All right. Uh, are you coming to Israel with us? That's a life changer. That's, that is a serious life changer. Go to my website, askdrbrown.org, A-S-K-D-R-Brown.org, right there on the homepage. There's info on that info on the new book, Political Seduction of the Church. It releases September 6th, but every day I'm signing new advanced copies to send out to you so the book is in stock physically with us. You can get your signed, numbered copy at the website, AskDrBrown.org. You'll also find info on the Israel trip. And if you don't get my emails, remember to sign up. We, we, are, we are working on massive revamp on apps that are oh, going to be light years ahead of where we've been. And you'll be the first to find out if you're on our email list. So AskDrBrown.org. Sign up today. 15 minutes from now, we'll be back on YouTube for our exclusive weekly Q&A chat. Thanks for joining us.